It's no secret that we think ESXi is the best hypervisor out there. Feel free to tell us how you disagree with that in the comments below. But in both home lab server builds we've done, we've skipped over the installation of ESXi in the setup. We've received numerous comments asking us to go through an ESXi install and setup. So in this video, we're gonna make good on that. We'll be walking you through the entire process from installing ESXi hypervisor to creating your first virtual machine. One word of warning, this video is long. So use those timestamps to navigate around as needed. Before we get started though, let's get some assumptions out of the way. First, you've got your system set up with at least one network interface and two hard drives or storage targets for a data store and ESXi install. Second, you have the knowledge on how to burn an ISO to a CD or build a USB stick based off of an ISO. Downloading ESXi for free starts off with going to VMware.com and heading to the download section at the top of the screen. Next, navigate over to free product downloads on the left and then to vSphere hypervisor. To obtain a free copy of ESXi and a free basic perpetual license, you'll need to have a VMware account. If you have one, you can immediately download ESXi. If you don't, you gotta jump through the hoops to create an account, but I promise it's not painful. Go do it now. After your account is created, you'll be able to download ESXi and you'll see your free license key. Save this key, you'll need to add it to your hypervisor later. Boot off your USB install stick or burn CD of the ESXi ISO you downloaded from VMware. The first thing you're going to see is the initial loading and decompressing of the files that are part of the installer. This process can be quick or slow depending on what your installation media is. Ah, your first taste of the signature gray and yellow ESXi console window. Bask in its two-toned glory. At this moment, the ESXi installer is loading all of its modules and drivers into memory before we start the actual installation process. Welcome to the VMware ESXi 701 installation. VMware would really like you to know what the VMware compatibility guide is and where to see it. And it's actually a useful thing to check if you're concerned about whether your hardware is supported by VMware. We'll hit OK to continue on. Now on to the EULA, which we've totally read and memorized by heart. We'll press F11 to move on to the next step. Next stop is the installer scanning the hardware of your system to find available storage devices you can target to install ESXi. Okay, so our installer found two disks in our machine. Notice that my disks are VMware virtual disks. That's because I'm installing ESXi inside a virtual machine that's running on ESXi. It's pretty cool that we have an inception like that. I know Leonardo DiCaprio would be super proud. But in all seriousness, keep in mind that if you want to experiment in your home lab with building different environments, it's a neat way to create an entire miniature virtual home lab world. And as a side note, this is how VMware does its training for students. Anyway, you might have a lot of storage devices in your system and you might be confused about which one is which. We have two here, one 4 gig that will be our installation location for ESXi and one 100 gigabyte disk that will later turn into our data store to hold our virtual machines. If at any time you're confused about what is what, you can press F1 and get additional details about the storage device. Here's the disk details. It tells me the model and vendor of the storage device, the unique name the installer has named the disk, the type of bus interface it uses, if it already has an installation of ESXi on it, if it's an SSD, and if there are data stores on the disk already. We'll hit enter and go back to the list of storage devices. Really quick, you can target any number of devices to be your ESXi installation location. In all of our virtual hosts here in the studio, we use internal USB sticks as our installation target, and that's a completely reliable and supported way to install ESXi if you have a host with an internal USB port. You can also use a single disk, a mirror of disks if you're concerned about redundancy, and so on. Again, for our purposes here, we'll select our four gigabyte installation disk that will be our pretend internal USB stick. Press enter to select the disk. Now we gotta choose our default language for the hypervisor. We're in the United States and we're using a default query keyboard, so we'll leave its default and hit enter. Okay, it's time to give the root user its password. In ESXi, root is the highest level privilege user. If you're familiar with Linux, you're familiar with what the root user is. If you're a Windows user, root is the equivalent of the local PC administrator. Enter your password of choice twice and hit enter to continue. Next stop is just a confirmation that we're about to install ESXi on our chosen storage device, and if there's any data on the disk, it's gonna go bye-bye. Let's hit F11 to kick this thing off. Installation can be quick or it can take a while. It all depends on what you're installing ESXi on. If it's a USB stick internally, it will take a bit as it writes to the stick, so sit back and enjoy. Boom, ESXi is installed. Let's hit enter and reboot this host. 
Okay, ESXi is loading. Notice at the top where it says loading VMware ESXi and not loading VMware ESXi installer. That's a quick and easy way to tell you're now booting off of your freshly installed hypervisor and not the installation media. Once we're fully booted, we'll be greeted by the ESXi console. Ah uh, yes, more of that truly stunning gray and yellow ASCII work of art. I'm kidding, obviously. But it is the standard ESXi console, the thing you'll see every time you plug your monitor into the host. This display shows us the version of ESXi, the CPUs that are installed, and the clock speed of those CPUs, and the amount of memory on the host. Down below we see the to manage this host go to text, but before we jump over to the web interface of the hypervisor, we're going to change our IP address from DHCP to a static address. Let's talk about why first. With all infrastructure systems like this, it's always best practice to use a static IP address and never use DHCP as a means of addressing for critical systems. Relying on DHCP is a risk, especially if your DHCP server goes offline and your lease to your host expires. Without an IP address, you won't be able to manage the host. And also, DHCP addresses can change over time, leading you searching for the current address of your host. Not a good thing. So we'll press F2 to make some changes, enter in your freshly set root password, and hit enter. This is the system customization screen where we can make basic configuration changes to our hypervisor. This is also where you can reset your configs if all is broken and you just need a do-over. We're going to focus on just configuring the management interface of this host. Navigate down to configure management host interface and hit enter. Here's where we'll switch from DHCP to static and set our static address. I'm going to give this host an address on my network I know is not going to cause a conflict and leave everything else the same. Same subnet and default gateway and press enter. You can also change your DNS configuration of the host while you're here. Set a host name, add multiple DNS suffixes if you have them on your internal network, but we're just going to go ahead and hit escape to log out. And say yes to our changes and we're back to the main console where we can see the new static address has been set. Okay, we are done with the initial setup. Next step is to open up a web browser and log into the web interface to set up our data stores, virtual networks, and so on. Let's get to it. Pop open your modern browser of choice. I'm using Chrome, and in the address bar at the top, enter the static IP address you configured on the ESXi console. Depending on your browser, you'll likely be greeted by a your connection is not private message because your new ESXi host has a self-signed SSL certificate that your browser doesn't trust. It's okay, we'll get through this. Just click advanced and proceed on to the site. Thanks, Google. Ooh, pretty blue. This is the login page of ESXi. You remember that root user and password we set? That's the creds we use to log in here. Let's do it now and click log in. VMware would love to have you sign up for their customer experience improvement program. It's not mandatory and it's completely up to you whether you'd like to participate or not. Click OK and make that nagging window go away. Welcome to the VMware ESXi hypervisor UI. Let's take a moment and go over it so you can get familiar. In the center middle of the screen is an overview of your virtual host, its hardware, its configuration, and its system information. Below that is the recent tasks pane, where recent tasks and operations will appear. You'll see entries there when something happens on the host, like starting or stopping VMs, making configuration changes, and so on. It's an at-a-glance list, and things fall off it rather quickly, so just because you don't see it listed there doesn't mean it didn't happen. Now on the left side of the screen is where we find the navigation pane. Here's where we'll switch between the different areas of the UI. We're already on the host tab, so let's click on the manage tab. Inside this screen, we have the system tab, which has sub options for advanced settings, auto start for configuring which VMs you want to start up automatically when the host starts and in what order, swap, which allows you to set your host swap file settings and the time and date settings for the host. Next tab over is the hardware tab. Inside here, we'll see all of the detected hardware of your physical host running ESXi. In most cases, these items will be grayed out for you because you can't modify any configurations for them, but you can click on them to get further details. If you are planning on passing through any physical hardware installed on this host, this is where you'd configure it. Also, we have a power management tab that allows you to configure your power management policies for the host if that's your thing. For a basic configuration though, this isn't necessary. Next up is the licensing tab where you can, you guessed it, add your license key that you got when you signed up and downloaded ESXi. You have a 60-day evaluation of ESXi starting day one of your fresh install to play with all of the features if you'd like. For basic VMs, your free license will work just fine, but you don't need to be in a rush to add your license until you get close to your license expiration. Packages are next. Essentially, this is a full list of all the modules and driver packages that were installed when you installed ESXi. You can also install more packages via the Install Update button, but that's outside of our wheelhouse for this video, so let's stay in our lane. Services is up next. Here you can see all of the services and daemons that are running on the hypervisor. You can start, 
stop and restart them as needed, but beware doing so might affect your host. Buried below here would be the SSH server service that you can start if you wish to log into the command line interface of your ESXi host. Last is security and users. Within here, you can set your system's acceptance level, which is more of an advanced configuration setting for package security, set up Active Directory authentication under the authentication tab, change certificates if you're too good for a self-signed cert, add users, roles, and configure lockdown mode. Back over to the navigation pane, let's choose monitor. The first tab is the performance tab, which gives you a bird's eye view of your system's performance. You can select different performance graphs like CPU, memory, network, and disk performance. Next tab over is the hardware tab. If your hardware has IPMI enabled sensors, you'll find details about them here. People who are running ESXi on desktop hardware will likely not see anything listed here, while people running on server gear will see details from any IPMI hardware sensors on their system. Same thing goes for the storage tab. You'll find details about the health of your storage system, assuming your storage supports it. The events tab is pretty self-explanatory. Here's where you can dig through previous events that have occurred on your host. Tasks give you a view of the tasks that have run on the host and whether they executed successfully or not. The Logs tab is the home of the logs of your ESXi host. If you're interested in the gory details of what's happening in your host, dig through these logs to satisfy that need. Also, when things go sideways, this is the place to start digging. Lastly, the Notifications tab. If any notifications pop up on the UI, they'll be collected here. So if you happen to dismiss something you didn't intend to, check here. Next up, Virtual Machines. And as you might have guessed, here's where you'd create, start, stop, and generally manipulate VMs running on the host. Now onto Storage. Here's where you'll manage any data stores you have on your system. A data store is VMware's term for a pool of storage that will contain your VMs. At first, we don't have any data stores defined. We'll take care of that in a moment. Lastly, this is the networking tab. Here's where we define and create virtual switches, manage physical NICs, VM kernel NICs, and more. Things can get complex here, but thankfully, right out of the box, your new host has a default virtual switch, also known as a vSwitch, ready to go and connected to the same NIC you defined as part of your management network setup during the initial install. One more cool quick thing to show you here is the visualization of the vSwitch. If you select the Virtual Switches tab under Networking and then select the default vSwitch 0 switch, you'll see under the vSwitch topology a visual representation of this virtual switch. On the left, you'll see the VM network portion of the virtual switch here, where VMs that you assign to the VM network will virtually connect from. Below, you see the management network and the interface for the host we assigned earlier. And on the right, you see the physical network interface of the host itself that connects to your home network. This tab also gives you details about MTU size, the quantity of the available virtual ports, attached VMs, and more. There are very few things we need to configure right out of the box to get started building VMs. First thing is getting the date and time set on the host. Let's swing over to the Manage tab and the System tab within and click on Time and Date. Click Edit NTP Settings. Choose Use Network Time Protocol Enable NTP Client radio button, change the NTP server startup policy to start and stop with host, and enter your favorite upstream NTP provider. We'll throw in Google's NTP host and click Save. Okay, it's time to set up our first data store. Navigate back to storage on the left. Once there, click the new data store button at the top. Now we're greeted with the new data store wizard. We'll be creating a new VMFS data store, so let's click that and click Next. Now we need to give our new data store a name. What you choose to name it is completely up to you and you can always change the name in the future if you want to. We're gonna be super technical here and name ours data store one because we're original like that. Click next. Here's where you can decide how you want to break up the disk. For the simplest configs, we're going to just consume the entire disk. If you need to break up a disk into multiple partitions, go for it. But keep in mind doing so won't give you better performance. Click next. Okay, it's time to review our impending changes to disk. All looks good, so let's click Finish. Say yes to the nagging warning about impending formatting and erasure of the target disk, and boom, we have our first data store. Outstanding work. I think it's time for us to build a quick virtual machine as an example here, but before we do that, we need to get an ISO to build the VM into our data store so we can mount it to the VM when we start it up. This is a good time for you to download a copy of Ubuntu Linux and save that ISO somewhere easy to get from your PC. I'll wait, but not too long. Get on it. Okay, great. Now click on your new data store at the top and click on Data Store Browser. This page will allow you to navigate the data store's file system. By default, it's pretty empty in here, so let's create a folder to hold our downloaded ISO. Click Create Directory. We'll call ours ISOs, because that's what we're going to put in there. Now click Create Directory. We can now see our ISOs directory and it's empty. Let's upload the ISO that we downloaded. Select the ISOs directory and click Upload at the top. Select your ISO and click Open to start the upload. Once the upload is complete, you'll see the ISO listed in the directory. Click Close. Now let's head over to our Virtual Machines tab and make our first VM. 
Up at the top, click create slash register VM. Okay, here's the VM creation wizard. We're gonna make a new VM, so let's select create a new virtual machine and then we'll click next. We'll need to give it a name. We'll call ours Linux VM because we're original like that. And then we'll select the guest OS family. The term guest is another word for a virtual machine and in this case, it's going to be Linux, so we'll choose Linux. Next, we'll tell ESXi which version of Linux our guest VM will be running. So we'll navigate to Ubuntu 64-bit and now we'll hit next. Okay, remember that data store we just built a bit ago? Yeah, that one. That's the one that we'll be selecting to hold our VM's files. Since we only have one in the system anyway, we'll just hit next. Now we get to determine the hardware of our new VM. The defaults here are the ones that VMware provides based on the OS family inversion you chose previously. Of course, you know better about what your VM is going to need than the defaults do. So take a moment and decide how much CPU, memory, and storage you wish to assign to your VM. You'll also notice that your default VM is assigned to the default VM network via its virtual NIC, and so once it's up and running, you'll have network access. Before we continue on, we need to assign that ISO we uploaded to our data store so that our virtual machine can boot off that image. So click the box that says host device under CD slash DVD drive one and select data store ISO file. Now you're greeted with the familiar file explorer of your data store. Navigate to the location of the ISO we uploaded, select it and click select. Okay, let's light this candle. Click next to continue on. Final page is just the details of what's about to be committed to disk. Have a look and click finish. That sweet new VM you just created is ready to be started. Let's click on its title to have a look at it first. Now let's click on the play button in the middle of the darkened screen there to start our VM. Here we go. Your first VM is running on your freshly installed ESXi host. You rock. What you do from this point on with your hardware and VMs is totally up to you. Tell us what you think of this video. We'd love to hear from you. Would you like to see more how to's? Let us know in those comments. If this is the first time you've seen us, consider subscribing, like do it right now. We're on Twitter and Instagram, so go follow us and be all social. And finally, we have a Discord. We'd love to have you join it. Talk about videos we make, home lab, and more. It's a great community and we'd love to have you. Thank you for watching and we will see you again soon.